This video contains subject matter that may be offensive and disturbing to some people. If you are the type to require a warning throughout a video or show, let this message serve as your warning. This channel discusses the harsh reality of true crime. If this warning is not sufficient for you, consider a different genre and unsubscribe from my channel immediately. What's going on, freaks? Yep, so welcome, uh, Danielle, to the mods for the YouTube. She's always watching all the different shows, and she's kind of, um, <laughs> I don't know what it is. I, I would say Zozo and Dan, uh, Danielle are sisters from a different mother. <laughs> That's really pretty crazy. But anyways, she's always here, and you know, I can tell she really loves the channel and everything. So I thought, and she's always nice to everybody as well. So I figured, man, she'd be perfect. So there you go, everybody. Yeah. So anyways, around lunchtime today, we did a, uh, what was it? A, uh, well, we did the Jody Arias Day 2. It seemed like people kind of liked it. But uh, I don't know, man. <clears throat> Not sure what's going on these days, but it's pretty crazy. So uh, if you're somebody that's new here, or if you haven't been to this channel, uh, what we do... Uh, every single night on this channel, people send in super chats, and you guys support what I do, and then that allows me to keep doing what I'm doing, and then I also give back uh, quite a bit, uh, over 50% of the net revenue to various charities out there from YouTube, all right? So when I do these shows, you know, I spend, you know, quite a few hours putting things together and all stuff like that. I would appreciate it if you guys could support the channel. Last night was this weird anomaly. Uh, I'm not sure what was going on there. It was really bizarre. And then, uh, but that's just, it is what it is. Like if you're, when you go to Starbucks and somebody makes you a drink, you help support, you know, you send them a, a tip, right? So I know, yeah, I do these every single day, but there's people that eat at Starbucks every single day, you know? So now that's really the only way to keep it going here. That's why we've given $144,250 to true crime related charities since January 2020. Okay, that's it. I mean, if we don't do that, then we're doing something else. And one of these days, a lot of the money that we've put into the DNA funds will come to fruition. All right, trust me on that. And I'm still testing negative. Not sure what the hell the deal is. It just kind of keeps lingering around. I mean, positive, excuse me. It keeps lingering around. I have no idea what's, what that's about. Apparently, it can just keep hanging out. Thank you, Melissa South and Matthew Ludovico. Or was it Ludovico? <coughs> uh, anyways. <laughs> There you go, that's it. So that's the reality. And I don't know what else to tell you guys, but um, you know, I do put a lot of time in for, for you guys to do these shows, all right? Excellent. Hey, it's Bama Forever. How's it going? All right, so let me do, it'd be great if I had 2,000 members and they're all 
consistently staying around. They weren't gifted to people. And thank you, Melissa South. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Okay, let's see. Not sure. I'm trying to figure out which one to start with here. Well, first thing I was going to tell you is that. Um, this is the. Wait, wait, what happened there? Oh, uh, same one or wait, one? I <laughs> got confused there. It was doubling up on the other show. I'm not sure what was going on. But. Yes, I do have Venmo out there. I think it's underneath the, if you type in like links, right? Is that right? I don't know how that works, but, but thanks, Lynn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Bethany Funk is, she's agreed to meet with Koberger's attorneys where they're from, and I guess in, in Nevada. So it says the uh, stipulation, Bethany, uh, uh, stipulation is that Bethany Funk, through her attorney, has agreed to an interview with Idaho Defense Counsel in Reno, Nevada, in lieu of of proceeding forward with the uh, subpoena for preliminary hearing. So she is going to meet with his attorneys. He's not going to be there, though. So that's a, that's pretty good. I mean, they I think it was just a fishing expedition anyways to see if she could say certain things. Right? It's pretty obvious. Oh, yeah. Now we got the trolls, everybody. Troll fun. Here we go. Yeah. Do you guys think there's something wrong with saying, hey, everybody, can you help please support the channel? Is there anything wrong with that? What am I supposed to do? Just sort of do like uh, three or four hour shows and just hope to God somebody, <laughs> you know what I mean? I think it's crazy to think that it's bad to do that, especially what the great stuff that we've done with it. All right. And it just is what it is. Uh, if, if I don't do this channel, I'll still be uh, doing, I'll be existing in the world. Yeah. So anyways, that's what the, uh, these trolls, they always come in and act like it's bad. Yeah, I think that there's a difference between people who come up with some story and uh, people send money in and that's it. It just disappears, right? Like we had some lady coming in, in here telling us that her eye got blown out in a uh, lawn mowing accident. And we were like, holy shit, and uh, sent money to her GoFundMe. And all miraculously, there's a picture with her with her both her eyes after that. That's what I would consider somebody doing. <laughs> you remember that, Zozo? Uh, it was pretty crazy. So I would consider that to be bad. That's not what I'm doing. Yeah, hey, wow, thanks, Bama Forever. Jeez. She said, still can't figure out why people get upset with what I do with my money. Weird. Yeah. It is pretty crazy, right? I mean, I, I'm actually, I would say that I am an open book. I don't try to hide what we're doing. Yes, I do make an income on here. I feel like I work really hard and... Uh, I just, I mean, <laughs> do you feel like in three years, 144,000 verified dollars given to charities and a DNA fund is something to be proud of regardless? <laughs> I, 
I am. I, I feel really good about it. Yes, I get to write it off to taxes too. But it's not dollar for dollar like everybody always tries to say. Yeah, it's wild. It, it's crazy. Now there it is. Look at that. There it is. Yeah, who, who's that? Still can't Jesus. figure out why people get upset <laughs> with what I do with my money. Weird. Yeah. Anyways, thank you so much. So if you're out there and you can afford it and, you know, want to help me out tonight, that'd be great. And it really just keeps the ball rolling is what it does. I don't know if anyone else that does this. Does what? The, the money, the donations or what? This part right here? I'm not sure what you're saying. I'm having a hard time understanding. I'm just waiting for uh, the answer there by uh, yeah I mean you, don't you think it's pretty crazy Sue's Q Reynolds that we I mean that's almost you could buy a house with that a good one in some parts of the United States thank you traveling Teresa And that doesn't even include a lot of the money that I give back, you know, the, you guys. I mean, last year I did $6,000 in give backs, like 5800 or something. <laughs> you know. But man, he's so mean. He's just sick of troll ways. Man, there you go. Hey, thanks, Amber. I love those trolls sometimes. Isn't that great? They're just... I can see you, Slapstick. By the way, Slapstick1973 said me an email and apologized for... They just totally misread the thing about uh, that Uber Eats. They read it like the person eats the victim and thought it was a cannibal thing. All right, so... Anyways, thanks for the, sending me the email. Um... I'm feeling okay. You know, it's like I just want to be Ivanka? done. They keep testing positive and it's stupid. I am donating one for each like you know, cough a little bit here and there. Right hand corner. Strike six oh three. Go go go. Hit that like. Thanks, you're a gypsy. Wait, what was that one up there? Stick a stick of troll wave. Go go go. Who said go 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 likes? Where's that one? <laughs> Chewbacca? Oh, I'll be Chewbacca if you want me to. Following the way. Oh, well, thank you, Salty C, for the uh, cash app. That was very kind. Now, well, let's see what we got. Oh, I get to get a notebook for uh, Tracy in the chat there. And then earlier, Paulette and uh, uh, Lori. I don't know if I want to. I'm not going to say the names. I don't, I don't think that's how she goes by in, on YouTube. Thank you, Tracy Nixon. Yeah, Lori Will. I think all these, every story tonight is going to be pretty ocean interesting. Wave, ocean wave, ocean wave. Thank you, Lori Will. You're so mean. Here's a few dollars. <laughs> I know it's weird, Zozo, isn't it? Uh, Zozo said, I think it's a bit strange that people create accounts to troll someone that they don't like but watch. How does that work? Yeah, it's kind of. It's almost. Um, it might even be on the DSM 5 somewhere, don't you think? Thank you, John Dunn. Melissa South, fit five months. Lori Will, Tracy Nixon. One dollar for every like until clock below strikes six oh five. Go go go. 
Wait, donating one dollar for every like until clock below 605. <laughs> All right, hit the like button, everybody. Hurry up. Hit it. Hit the like button. 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 Like 10, 20, 25, 30. Hurry up. Hit that like button. Hit the like button. Hit the like button. Hit that like button. 30. 30, sir. 25, you're out. I'm at a dumb bird on 25. I'm at a dumb bird on 30. 30, now 5. I'm 35. Not quite there yet. What were we at? I didn't even see it. I guess I should have looked to see. Uh, uh, we're only at 101. <laughs> Come on, hit the like button, you guys. Hurry up. Six oh four, it's gonna be six oh five. Thanks, Melissa Sal. No, there it is, 605. We were at uh, 111. Not sure what the what it was before, though. That was 98, now it's 114. Okay. Well, he doesn't have to give me anything. Just sort of, I didn't know what it was. That was bastards. <laughs> if he had just all hit the like button at the same second, it could have been, it could have been glorious. I could have been somebody. Oh yeah, I did the uh, three minute of mystery. I wasn't feeling that great, so I felt like I was kind of rambling at times or whatever. But uh, <coughs> yeah, so it was me, Morph, and Lorden. It was pretty fun though. Like after we were done, that's when it got more entertaining. It was like that's how we should be recording and more like that, you know. Just when we're just rapping back and forth about oh yeah, so what about? That's how it should be. I, I'm more into that type of dialogue than scripting. You know what I mean? Like when you read something and then, and then have to have something to talk about because conversations what, what's, uh, what is what leads me to think differently about something. If you have a dialogue and when you're done and then you're sort of prompted to come up with something about something, it doesn't really work as well for me like that. I think it's, it's going to be on YouTube. Uh, wasn't there a three minute of mystery YouTube channel or something? Or? Yeah. No, really? There was 88? Wow. Thanks, man. Thank you so much. John Dunn! <laughs> Give you some couple more odds there just for doing that. Yeah, I don't think the podcast is. Uh, I don't think that's a, out there anymore. There's no feed or any place to put it. Oh yeah, there it is. Thank you, trolls. I'm on a roll, and that's your toll. Hey, that was pretty good, right? <laughs> Thank you, trolls. <laughs> I like that one. Thank you, trolls. I'm on a roll. That's your toll. Don't be a fool. Yeah, we just haven't used it for so long. I don't know if it's still there. When I started, ended with 118. I will settle the 32. Thanks for playing your. Well, thank you, man. John Dunn. Okay, here we go. Um... I'm going to do the, the really old cold case really fast because it's not really long, but it, it was one from Oregon. So it looked like it might be kind of interesting. It's from 1962 in Newport on the coast. <laughs> so I'm going to go up in that area for now and we'll just sort of see what, what the hell happened. Oh, is that where it is? Okay. Yeah, well, yeah, that's right. It's on Lord Nart's regular. I think it's on his. Yeah, he's not going to do a studio, right? Lord Nart Studio Two. Okay.
All right, here we go. This is the coast foul play suspected. So look, I mean, like you can just tell by how old this is. 1962 wasn't even born yet. Here, Lillian wasn't even born in, on this one. What do you mean even, Gray? What? <laughs> yeah. So it says uh, an intensive police search in un is underway for a 40-year-old Toledo woman who had been missing from her home here since March 30th. Oh, really? Wow. Huh. There wasn't any articles with her name in it. Thank you, Danielle. I can't wait till there's a case where both Zozo and Danielle are busting out their theories on me. I just I'm gonna I'm gonna go uh, apoplectic, as my mom would say. Well, <laughs> That's gonna be funny. It was funny. I was I actually was talked to Zozo, and she said, "Well, great. She's a hell of a lot like me." <laughs> I was like, "Oh God, I know." You know. I mean, the thing the thing is, that's why I, I I the same thing that Zozo does that drives me nuts is why I like her too, right? So it's good because it kind of keeps me on my toes, but at the same time, it's like ah yeah. Just like her, like I know she's a good boss in her real life, Zozo. Like she's amazing. You can you can tell all the cool little things that she does. But if I worked for her, she would she'd hit me in the head with a baseball bat probably in the first two days, guarantee it. All right. Thank you, Danielle. All right, here we go. So state police and sheriff's officers said there is likelihood foul play may have involved the woman in Miss Lucille Grenz's, or Miss Lucille Grenz of, so now we actually got an address right off the bat. That's always cool. 134 North West 6th Street. And then Toledo, Oregon, right there. Oh, it's okay. Don't worry about it, John. Dang, geez. But thank you. <laughs> Don't you hate how these bots read LOL? Uh, LOL? He goes, oops, forgot $2, lol. No, it's LOL bot. Wouldn't you figure that out yet? Okay, let's go down to right. Oh, look at that. There's even street view on this small coastal town right there. You guys think that that looks like it might have been like updated or something? It's hard to say, but that's the. Uh, there it is, 134 right there. Uh, State Police Sheriff's Office. Officer. Off. Officers said, yeah, it's hard to read that. Officers said there is a likelihood foul play may have been involved. The woman is Mrs. Lucille Grenz. She's missing, this person. Of 134 Northwest 6th Street, Toledo, who disappeared from her home two months ago. Officers said the woman took no clothing or personal belongings with her, but that a mattress, bed, clothing, and set of drapes were missing from a room. I, that, to me, that just sounds so ominous, right? Like, uh, probably you had a pickup truck, put the mattress in the back, wrapped her up in all those other things. I mean, when you're, this is almost like a, the kill kit you buy, right? I mean, listen to this. It's a, that a, a mattress, bed, clothing, and set of drapes. The clothing part, Maybe that was an attempt to make it look like she took off. But the drapes, there's, you know, who brings drapes, right? And a mattress, really? I mean, so to me, there's a mattress. Maybe she was put on that. Maybe the drapes were put on the mattress, then she was wrapped up in it. And I mean, who knows, right? But State Police Sergeant L.R. Brockway, Sheriff Jack Waterman, and District Attorney A.R. 
McMullen traveled to Seattle recently to question a man with whom Miss Grintz had been keeping company. No charges were filed. I mean, it seems like, uh, I mean, who knows right at this point, because we, that's all we have. Officer said that no trace has been found of the woman since her unexplained disappearance. All right. Okay, now it's there's more stuff now. Blood found splattered in a home of a 40-year-old missing Toledo woman and in a car trunk. Oh, boy. So now you wonder if the curtains in the bed were removed because there was blood all over them. And they were like, we got to get... They took those out, too. And then when they say clothes is missing, is it all of her clothing or... Wow, so that's not good. Blood found splattered in a home of a 40-year-old missing Toledo woman and a car trunk of an acquaintance. <laughs> what? Uh, led law enforcement authorities to believe the woman met with foul play, they said Wednesday. The missing woman is Mrs. Lucille Grenz, also known as Mrs. Vaughn, Lincoln County District Attorney. Oh, Mrs. Vaughn. Hold on, let me check something. Hold on. I just want to see if that somehow Lucille Lucille Vaughn and that would have been 1962 Oregon. So if that's the only art one that comes up, then that's it. So this one says June. Fourth. What's the earliest one that I have? Hold on a sec. Oh yeah, so this could be... Is that her? No, it's something totally different. Let me put the uh, quotes. I just want to see if there's another version. Toledo Woman Said Missing. This is June 6th. Yeah, that's the earliest one that I have. How about this May one here? Is that? Daughter seeks missing mother. Okay, there we go. Something else. This is Lucille Vaughn, 41. I'm going to go save this one. Vanished last March 30th from her home at Toledo, Oregon. She hasn't been heard from since. Those greatly concerned about her whereabouts include a daughter, Miss Donna McKinney of 1094 Kingwood Drive, Northwest uh, Northwest, and then Miss McKinney said her mother had planned an early visit to Salem at the time she vanished. The missing woman was described as five feet, one inches, or one and a half. Uh, let's see, 150 pounds, blue eyes, red, short hair. Miss McKinney, a receptionist at Salem General Hospital, said her mother had suffered from frequent headaches. National anthem of the I'm not sure if that goes to the next one there. Let me see if there's one earlier. That was May 22nd. So it's kind of cool with uh, this newspapers.com. Like if right here, if I type in May 1962, put quotes around her name, that means it has to be there. Then you just click up here, and then you can see all the times it could be in there. There's a bond there. That's probably, that's not it. Oh yeah, there's a quote missing. Hold on, let me put one on this side. Yeah, so that's only one time in May. And then it even, then it shows up here the other months that it has it in. So there's June, and then you got four, six. Four is one that I don't have, except that's not related. Although, it, or, or is it, actually? Where, where is it? Lucille Vaughn. I wonder if she's one of these women this in this picture. Grey and Lord and will be played Friday in place of the regular Brain Scratch episode. I can't wait. Sweet. <laughs> I don't know how well I did in it. I, did, I felt kind of like COVID brain or whatever the hell you want to call it.
Okay, uh, so let me get back to this, this article here. We know, Sam, we know. We're going over the story, Sam. Thank you, Sam, though. Thank you so much for filling us all in. Uh, all right, uh, here we go. The missing woman is Mrs. Lucille Grins, who also known as Mrs. Vaughn, Lincoln County District Attorney A.R. McMullen said. Sheriff Jack Waterman and State Police Sergeant William Colbert and L.R. Brockway are investigating along with the District Attorney's Office. The acquaintance has been questioned at Seattle. The man who wasn't identified told officers he didn't know how the blood got in the trunk of his car. McMullen said the blood was human and was found splattered on the drapes, ceilings, uh, ceiling, wall, and elsewhere in the bedroom of the home here at 134 Northwest 6th Street. Right there. Is that crazy or what? All her personal belongings except the dress she was wearing March 30th. Let's see. All of her personal belongings except the dress she was wearing March 30th, the day she disappeared, were found in the home. So I thought you said, okay, so it was her clothes that she was wearing were missing. Missing from the home are a mattress, bed, clothing, and this, this is prior to DNA, so you got to sort of figure out, like, why would somebody, you know, what, what are they doing here? Are they just trying to hide the fact that she was even, like, killed? I mean, what's going on with this? are a mattress, bed, clothing. So the clothing is what she was wearing because they just said everything else was there except for her dress. And a set of drapes. So the drapes probably had blood all over them too. Uh, but there was still, sounds like there was all kinds of blood all over the place. Mrs. Grins had been married eight times. Ooh boy, police said. She was in the process of moving from the home at the time she disappeared. Oh boy. So I hope she wasn't just getting divorced right then. Because she was about to move out of that house. D.A. McMullen said there is not much we can do until we find her. A 17-year-old daughter called a sister in Salem when her mother failed to return. The sister in turn notified police. Oh. What do you guys think? That's <laughs> pretty pretty crazy, right? <laughs> All right, so here is a, uh, this is from October 31st that year. So now we're you know, four months later. So this might have extra information. Women enter, let's see, search for missing coast woman enters eight month. So there was two months where they were looking for her before it made the newspapers really. Investigation into the disappearance of 40 year old Mrs. Lucille Grenz of Toledo Toledo went into its eighth month today. There are growing indications she met with foul play. Well, of course she did, right? I mean, Ms. Grenz spoke with friends, but see, back then they couldn't test to see, oh, that, that is her blood on the walls. Ms. Grenz spoke with friends and headed for her home at one, so she spoke with some friends, and she headed for her home at 134 Northwest 6th Street in Toledo last March 30th. No one has been seen uh, nobody has seen her since then. The day after the woman disappeared, her 16-year-old daughter, Diane McKinney, became worried at her mother's absence. She called another sister who lives in Salem. And it says, little concern. It was a day or so later that the sister notified police. For a while, the Grins case caused little concern. Miss Grenz had left her home before without telling anyone. She had recently quit her job as a clerk in a Newport Variety store and was planning to move to Seattle within a few days to be near a boyfriend who had taken a job there. Well, they went to Seattle, didn't they, to check on some guy? The boyfriend told police the last time he saw the woman, she had told him she was going to a tavern to drink with friends. Oh man, so something. <laughs> yeah, really? Okay, so you were there, uh, you saw her. Let's see, the boyfriend told police the last time he saw the woman and she told him 
She was going to a tavern to drink with friends. I bet there's more to that right there. It was about seven weeks later that the investigation swung in the... I mean, by the way, did that guy report her missing? The boyfriend? It was about seven weeks later that the investigation swung into full operation. On May 21st, Diane and her foster mother returned to the vacant Gren's house to pick up some of the girl's clothing. The foster mother walked into Miss Gren's bedroom, took one look, and called police. Wait a minute. Well, why would that be on May 21st when she went missing in March, right? Yeah, March 30th. And headed for her home on 134 6th Street. So then on May 21st, it took that long for somebody to... On May 21st, Diane and her foster mother returned to the vacant Gren's house to pick up some of her... The girl's clothing, so her, her daughter's clothes, I guess. The foster mother walked into Mrs. Gren's bedroom, took one look, and called police. She had discovered what police had not known and what members of the missing woman's family apparently had failed to comprehend. The bedroom was disarranged. Blood, how, how did the police and everybody not notice this stuff, right? The bedroom was disarranged. Blood was splattered on the floor, walls, and ceiling. The bed, does this make any sense? <laughs> this is weird. Like you go there six weeks later, they hadn't gone into the house yet and looked around? The bloody evidence gave considerable weight to the theory that Miss Grenz did not leave her home voluntarily, but was a victim of foul play. Police discovered that except for the clothing she was wearing the day she last was seen, all her personal belongings remained in the house. There was no evidence that she had left the vicinity. Questioning of friends and neighbors of the missing woman has turned up no leads. I mean, it's weird, this part right here where it said, she had discovered what police had not known and what members of the missing woman's family apparently had failed to comprehend. They didn't notice that there was blood all over the place? And why didn't the police go into the freaking house to look around? And uh, by the way, okay, let me, let me, this is what I want to know. How did they know that the drapes, cl all, uh, I mean, the clothing that she was wearing and you know, those other items that they mentioned, how did they know that they were missing if they didn't go into the house? And if they went into the house, how in God's name didn't they see this blood all over the place? Anybody know? That's just, uh, it just already didn't make sense a few minutes ago. State Police Sergeant L.W., maybe we'll explain it. Uh, L.W. Brockway, Sheriff Jack Waterman, and District Attorney A.R. McMullen journey, uh, journeyed to Seattle where they questioned Miss, Mrs. Grenz's boyfriend. He likewise denied any knowledge of her whereabouts. Authorities now are playing a game, but you said you saw her when she went out, right? You didn't, we didn't know if that's that same day, though. I almost might have to read this article again. It's just, uh, <laughs> maybe I'm missing something. <clears throat> Authorities now are playing a game of wait and see. Their investigation is continuing, but further progress hinges on one of three developments. An outside clue as to her whereabouts. That's the first one. The second one, a determination that she is alive and well in another city, or discovery of her body of Mrs. Grenz was slain. Chances are good that a hunter, fisherman, or exploring youngster eventually will stumble upon her remains. But until one of those three occurs, the disappearance seven months ago of Lucille Grenz will remain a mystery, a mystery that has baffled her friends her neighbors and law enforcement officers in the Lincoln County area the past seven months. Well, I'm more baffled at this part up here. 
Let me just read this from right here. The boyfriend told police the last time he saw the woman, she told him she was going to a tavern to drink with friends. So he was there, but we don't know what day that was. It was about seven weeks later that the investigation swung into full operation. Before that, I was just, oh. <laughs> so obviously there wasn't, okay, so maybe that's the answer. They didn't take it seriously for seven weeks. Except, uh... Let's see, when you go back to this article here, it talks about, where is it? Where's the one? Oh, over here. McQueen's has been questioned at Seattle. So they, they've already went and talked to the boyfriend. Okay, so that was seven you know, weeks later, right away after they found the blood, they went to Seattle. So that's right around the time of this article. Okay, so this article here, I get it. I get it now. So this article here talking about the curtains and everything is already two months after she went missing. Okay. They had figured this out before these articles came out and that's why they, okay, I get it. Makes sense there. What doesn't make sense is that they spent, took so long for somebody of a importance to go into the house. So the, she went, let me explain it again. So on March 30th, she went missing, right? It took him seven weeks because on May 21st, that's when this uh, foster mother said, oh my God, right? But the first article I have is June 4th. So they've already said, oh yeah, uh, all of her stuff is gone except the clothing, the curtain, and that stuff. So that makes sense. That's bed. It says bed clothing. Well, what? Oh, bed clothing? <laughs> Okay, well, I, well, I've never heard of the word bed clothing in my life, so. I've heard, like, bedding, bed clothing, Jesus. All right, it doesn't have a comma, you're right. It says the bed clothing, mattress, and drapes were missing. And just the clothing she had on. Does everybody get it? Does it make more sense now a little bit? So now it's like, they didn't do any hardcore investigation and then finally when the foster mo mom goes in there they she notices all this blood then they get going and that's how they found out what was missing and so forth okay and then there was one more from 1963 a year later more than a year i think no a year after March 30th, 1963, so one-year anniversary. Let's see if there's anything else in here. I think it means like the, you know, the fitted bed sheet and stuff like that. We don't, people in the United States don't say bed clothing. I mean, I've never heard a soul say that in my life. Any of you guys? I did gray. I read uh, Little House in the Prairie when I was a kid. Okay, yeah, but... Well, it's, uh, it's just the way the picture looks, Danielle. It's hard to say. I mean, if you could lighten it up. I mean, th she does have shadows there, so her foreheads, obviously people's foreheads stick out. Her cheeks also have really dark there. I mean, I, I can show you a different picture. It doesn't quite look like that. See, I mean, I don't know if you can see that, but it doesn't look doesn't look the same, see that? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think it's even in the first one somewhere. This one, second one. Yeah, that, that one's dark too, but you can see, you know. All right, here we go. One year ago. Today, Lucille Grins waved goodbye to a friend and walked off towards her home at 134 Northwest 6th Street in Toledo. That sounds really similar to that one, but this is a different article. She had not been uh, seen since her disappearance had proved probably the most baffling mystery in Lincoln County in recent history. Most everyone concerned with the case now believes she met with foul play 
even relatives, um, let's see, where does it say? Even her relatives have all but given up hope she survives. To disregard her embroiled in repeated year old Murray West Shipley, it is a vexing, nagging, and frustrating case that has taken uncounted hours of exhaustive investigations and brought forth pitiful, pitifully little in the way of concrete evidence. Mrs. Grins lived in the house with her daughter, Diane McKinney, then 16. When Miss Grins disappeared, Diane called another sister, Donna McKinney, in Salem. A day later, the older girl called police, but no one thought much of it. So let's see, Mrs. Grins lived in the house with her daughter. Okay, so that's why she was with, with a foster daughter. So where was the daughter when something had happened to her? Miss Grins lived in the house with her daughter, Diane McKinney. When Miss Grins disappeared, Diane called another sister, Donna McKinney, in Salem. A day later, the older girl called police. Well, where was Diane at this time? But no one thought much of it. Miss Grins had left before without notice, and she'd quit her job at a variety store at Newport. So here, here's what it sounds like it could be that she was, um, what do you mean my sound is choppy? What do you mean? What, what's going on? What do you mean? Uh-oh, what's going on? Oh, you guys are cutting out? Shit. Let me make sure. Hold on a second. I don't really have any way to fix anything. <laughs> yeah, I think you guys just need to, like, refresh YouTube. I, I can't fix something that's not broken. Yeah, I have no drop frames, nothing. Yeah, I don't know what's weird. It's weird how YouTube does that sometimes. Like, sometimes when I go over to, uh, like, a channel that's live streaming, it's totally frozen and buffered, and then I hit refresh, and boom, it's, like, it's going nice. So I don't really know what the deal is. So everybody out there, if your audio sucks... Wait, hold on. It, oh, your audio... Uh, uh, hit the re ish. How was that for an imitation? Was that pretty good? Yeah, hit the uh, refresh on YouTube, all right? <laughs> That's exactly what it sounded like? Oh, <laughs> sweet. Awesome. Uh, what, a super chat did it? Is that what you're saying? Scouting dude? Hey, Eugenie. Well, that was Eugenie was the last one up there. I saw that one. <laughs> it sounded like that for you guys, huh? Crazy. <clears throat> All right, let me let me read this part again then. Most everyone concerned with the case now believes she met with foul play, even her relatives have all but given up hope she survives. You know, it's funny during this, we had to read the script today and I it just, I had to repeat something like six times because I was just, you know, kind of in a weird state. But I can go a while without having to repeat stuff when I read these things. To District Attorney A.R. McMullen, already embroiled, we already did that part. Miss Grins lived in the house with her daughter, Diane McKinney. All right? So it's a little weird, right? I mean... So how come Diane didn't notice, like, the blood and stuff? I mean, what happened here? Thank you, Rail Laney Jones. And by the way, if you guys want one of the notebooks, the new ones, they have the little paw print, you know, the blue and paw prints on them and stuff like that. They are, uh, you send 25 to PayPal, you get the blue pen, the blue notebook, and a stress ball. It's a freak heart that says freaks on it. So you can get your freak on by squeezing the stress ball. Anyways, thank you. Uh, yeah, so it's a little strange when you think that Miss Grins lived in the house with her daughter, Diane McKinney, then 16. When Miss Grins disappeared, Diane called another sister, 
Like, let me ask you something, Diane. Did you ever go into your mom's room after she went missing to see, hey, is mom in here? Because if you did, wouldn't you have seen blood all over the place like your foster mother saw way back then? I mean, that's a little weird. There's a lot of weird shit in this case, right? I mean, come on. What do you think of that? Thanks, Mr. Gray, for all you do. I listen every night. Heart. Yeah, I mean, just, just, uh, I don't know if you guys are following along here, but just for a second, just watch this. We already know now that it was like 50 days later when the foster parent, because Mrs. Grenz here is completely missing from everybody's, uh, you know, gone. So she's already in a foster system. Okay. So you're telling me when she came home and she called her sister, Donna, in Salem, a day later, the older girl called police. But no one thought much of it. Oh, so, okay. You're in the house. You know, you've got uh, Diane lives in the very same house, that small little house calls her sister Donna in Salem and says, hey, our mom's missing. Then Donna calls police and they go, yeah, well, give her some time. She runs away sometimes. So not one person went into Lucille's bedroom and said, wow, what the hell happened here? Until way later when the, the, the foster system is already involved and is taking care of Donna and then uh, they go over there to get her clothing because she they wanted to get all of her clothing out of there. And then, oh, my God, that sounds crazy to me. Does it that, does that sound weird to anybody else or is there a some version that makes sense? I mean, it's OK if you can think of something like and I'll go, oh, OK, yeah. But you, you, you've got Diane in the house here who is where in the hell is my mom? so freaked out about it that she calls her sister but not once goes into the room and sees that the bedding's gone and there's blood all over the place and the you know, the bed and the bedding and you know oh actually she said bed clothing so the bed is still there <laughs> so just the Oh, you think maybe that the kid was already in foster care? No, it, no, it wasn't. Because right here it says, Miss Grenz lived in the house with her daughter. I just read that a minute ago. Diane McKinney, who was then 16. So they both lived in this little tiny house here together. See, you guys, that's why some of these older ones are like way more interesting than... Some of the shit that you see uh, people focus on. I mean, this is crazy right here. She lived in the house with her daughter, Diane McKinney, then 16. When Miss Grenz disappeared, so when Lucille disappeared, Diane, the daughter who lived with her in that very same house, called another sister, Donna, who lived in Salem. Salem's probably like 40, 50 miles away. A day later, the girl called police. Now, when you say the older girl called police, which is Donna. But no one thought much of it. Miss Grenz left before without notice, and she'd quit her job as a variety at a variety store at Newport a few days before with an announcement she was going to move to Seattle to be near a boyfriend who was taking a job there. So that makes the boyfriend seem a little less likely unless he didn't really want her to move there because he was actually with somebody and she was just somebody like a booty call that he would go over and see her and she was getting too like, and then he knew that would get, um, like the jig would be up so he had to do something about it. So that's a possibility. Yeah, I mean, it, it just, wouldn't the first thing you would do if your mom, you couldn't find your mom, it, wouldn't you look in the bedroom first almost? You guys? 
Seriously. Like, you would just kind of go, oh, let me go check the bedroom. Thank you, Melissa South. Yeah, <coughs> uh, it was about, and I never, I did actually just grab the articles and hadn't gone over this yet, as you can tell. So it's, um, I'm glad, <laughs> it's just crazy sometimes these cases are, hmm. Makes you sort of wonder if there's something associated with the daughter's, like a boyfriend that she had or something. Because that's too weird to me. Uh, Diane returned to the house to remove some clothing. Okay, so it says right here. It was about seven weeks later, so that was that May 21st, that the investigation went full bloom. Diane returned to the house to remove some clothing with her with her was her foster mother the woman looked into mrs gren's room and then telephoned police see that means they didn't look into her room before that what are you talking about inside officers discovered what no one else had known and what the members of the family apparently had not comprehended comprehended the bedroom was disarranged. It seems like they're using the same wording as the other one. Blood was spattered over the floor, walls, and ceiling. A check of the house. So does that mean she just, like Diane did look in there, just didn't notice it because they're sort of implying right here that had not comprehended, the family had not comprehended. A check of the house showed that only, the only things missing were the bed clothes. So the bed was... Oh, the mattress was gone too. So like the sheets were gone, the mattress was gone, and drapes from Mrs. Grant's bedroom. And I think maybe maybe it wasn't as noticeable as the foster mom. She sees it because she's looking, oh, there's a dot there and a dot there. But I mean, it seems like though, I got to just say, like if you were looking for your mom, you would go into her room and sort of, look around for a while and kind of move look to see if there's a note or something and i think you would have noticed blood in a situation like that right but i think all this stuff was removed to hide the blood from being really obvious right away even though the foster mother saw it because there's no other reason that dna didn't exist back then so uh, check of the house showed that only things missing were the bed clothes, mattress, drapes from Mrs. Grin's bedroom, and the clothes she was wearing the last day she was seen. Since that date, state police, sheriff deputies, city officers, and McMullen's office have worked doggedly and unraveling. Questioning of friends and neighbors has brought no leads. Miss Grin's boyfriend was interrogated but claimed uh, no knowledge of her whereabouts. Huh. How old was this uh, boyfriend? And then, then he got this daughter. And he says he saw her going to a bar. Wouldn't that be... I'll just tell you. Here's a conspiracy theory. That the boyfriend and the daughter... Like, there was something there and he did something and everybody's... <laughs> I don't even want... It's just it's too wild. But it doesn't make sense to me. 38 months. Oh, you want me to do it right now really quick? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Please, Gray, do it. No, thanks. You know what I could do is block Zozo and then add her back two seconds later. Just so she can feel, you know. Did you hear what I said earlier, Zozo? When I was saying I can't wait for the day when you and Danielle are asking the same questions about a case. Oh, God. Oh, boy. Thirty-eight. That's a long time. What is that? Three years, and I think that's when membership started on YouTube.
Uh, questioning of friends and neighbors has brought no leads. Miss Gren's boyfriend was interrogated but claimed to know uh, to no knowledge of her whereabouts. No one has been found who has since seen her or uh, seen her since that March day. The investigation is continuing the mystery. How do they know she went missing? Okay, so it was March. That's when, so the daughter called the next day. Her sister. The investigation is continuing the mystery. Uh, the McMullen and McMullen said the case still is a long way from being closed. But until Lucille Grenz is discovered or a new lead develops, it mostly is a game of wait and see. And as a full year from the date of her disappearance rolls around, the slight hopes that once were held for her safety are fading. Her daughter, Donna, comments quietly, we're assuming she's no longer alive. Well, let's, let's do a, a poll here. How about boyfriend, daughter, uh, Actually, I have to go over this other area to do this. There we go. Okay, here's the poll question for you. Yeah, there's a lot of, lot of weird stuff going in there, Alley Cat, isn't there? I mean, it's just... Uh, right, just stay at home and the state gives her the money to, you know. Sorry, I spelled unknown wrong there. Typing too fast. <clears throat> Come on, everybody, get some votes in there. Get some uh, an accurate feel here. <laughs> All right, so right now it's 22. Uh, <clears throat> so the boyfriend, 22, daughter, 22, boyfriend and mom and daughter. So I meant boyfriend of the mom and the daughter. Wouldn't that be weird if he was sort of after her in some way? Maybe they even, you know, sort of liked each other. I don't know. I, I, it's just too wild of a speculation. But it's just the part that bothers me a lot is that the daughter didn't see, even go into the room to notice that there's blood. If you're a daughter and your mom goes missing, you're going to go into a room and you're going to look around and look through stuff, try to find a clue of some sort. And you're not going to notice that, I mean, not miss, you're not going to notice that there's blood all over the place. It only takes until you go all the way to, through the system where you've got a foster mom who the state puts you with. And then you, you go, hey, I need some clothes. You go over there. And then that's the lady who goes into the very room that you're going to go in to get your clothes or whatever. Or you went into her room just randomly, the mother's room, and you go, oh my God, look at all this. Why didn't the 16-year-old go in there? Yeah, I was wondering about the 16-year-old had a boyfriend too earlier. Like, does she have somebody and she's moving and the boyfriend didn't want them to move, so he did something? That just sounds like a really, really violent event happened in there. So, anyways, that's it, you guys. That is the, the story. Let me hit the, what do we got here?
Thank you, Adniram. So the final tally here is boyfriend of mom and daughter, boyfriend of mom and daughter, 31%. <laughs> See, that's pretty crazy. Then it was boyfriend, 26. So that's interesting that uh, Chewbacca? Oh, I'll be Chewbacca the boyfriend of mom, the boyfriend, it makes up 57%. Part of that, though, includes the daughter with him because that is absolutely crazy. I mean, who would suspect that as well, right? And then the unknown, and then the last one is just the daughter, 18%, just by herself. You know, that'd be kind of hard to do all that, I guess. Yeah. I might uh, wouldn't it be cool to figure out more about this one? There's got to be a cold case squad work, you know, I don't know if they're still working it, but to get the case files of some sort and ask somebody if they're still alive. I mean, it'd be hard to even find somebody alive that was working on this. This is you'd be uh 87 years old minimum or you know, if you're 27 and a, and a detective, you'd be 87 years old right now. Well, you know, maybe we get a hold of the, well, the, even the daughter. Think, I'll, think of this, this the 16-year-old in the story is uh, 76 years old at this point. Right? <laughs> that's just, that's mind boggling. And then there's an older sister. Yeah, what was the part about blood in a trunk of somebody? You know, remember that one, the earlier article? Let me, let me open that one up again. Sorry. Yeah. Is this the one right here? Didn't know how the blood got in the trunk of his car. The uh, yeah, so that's the if that's the boyfriend here. Oh, let's re let's read this again now that we're a little bit more familiar. Okay, let me just read it again. Blood found splattered in the home of a 40-year-old missing Toledo woman, and in a car trunk of an acquaintance. That's the boyfriend. Led law enforcement authorities to believe the woman met with foul play. They said Wednesday the missing woman of Mrs. Lucille Grintz, also known as Mrs. Vaughn, Lincoln County District Attorney A.R. McMillan said, thanks for having us go back and look at that because the Seattle connection that we uh, that I, I heard and I was like, wait, so how come they went to Seattle the first time? Because they weren't specific when they mentioned it then. So it says Sheriff Jack Waterman and State Police Sergeant William Colbert, L.R. Brockway, are investigating along with the District Attorney's Office. The acquaintance has been questioned at Seattle. Boom. Oh, this is ridiculous. This is freaking nuts right here. So look at the acquaintance has been questioned in Seattle. That's the boyfriend. That's we know that because he lives in Seattle and she was going to move there. Right. The man who wasn't identified told officers he didn't know how the blood got in the trunk of his car. Oh, God. And they didn't have DNA testing back then. And, oh, man, I'll tell you what, if they have any sample of the blood in the back of that car, they could solve this case right now. That is the answer right there. So the boyfriend, uh, that doesn't rule out the other possibility because it's a little strange that, uh, you know, you have a daughter that doesn't go look. I mean, I, I doubt the daughter's involved, but I just think it's really strange that she doesn't go into her mom's room and notice all the blood all over the place. In a, in a like, in the first few days. Like, hey, where's mom? I gotta go call my sister. 
McMullen said the blood was human <laughs> and was found splattered on the... Dr well, okay, hold on a second. The acquaintance has been questioned at Seattle. The man who wasn't identified told officers he didn't know how the blood got in the trunk of his car. Uh -huh. uh, McMullen said the blood was human and was found splattered on the draped ceilings wall and elsewhere in the bedroom. So I'm not sure how they jump to that. Like, was this blood human, though? And here's the thing. The man who wasn't identified told officers, I don't know how the blood got in the trunk of this car. Isn't that a red flag already? How many people would have a ton of blood in their trunk and actually not have a clue how it got there? Yeah, this that guy is the... I mean, I, I would be shocked. If he's not the one who did this. I, I would love to see the investigative notes uh, when they interrogated that guy. What he was saying. I think it's, here's what I think is possible. That that guy was married to somebody. And he was, she was just sort of a fling for him. And then she's like, I'm moving up there. And he knew that it would spoil it. A little bit like the um, Angie case that we did I forgot her last name Angie and remember the guy that his brother sings the song uh, makes that really pretty song that case is sort of similar because remember he was working at the uh, pizza hut and so at the pizza hut she um, this, this 16 year old Angela Freeman, there you go, thanks, Sosa, went to the Pizza Hut to talk to him because she was just kind of a booty call for him. And it turns out she said that she was pregnant, uh, apparently. And then he takes her somewhere after work and she disappears forever. She's never been found. And he had, a, he had a girlfriend at the time in college, the one that he really liked. But he didn't want it to ruin that, so he killed Angela Freeman, right? So if you look at it like that, it, you could see something similar here. Maybe. Oh, like they don't know that he was a boyfriend? How come later they know he's a boyfriend? In different articles. Yeah, I, I, I check in on the Angela Freeman case ever so often. Yeah, they definitely need to try that one as well as the, that other case where the cat hair was found in the back of the pickup truck with the girl who was having an affair with a married man who had borrowed tons and tons of money from her herself. And then she, uh, they were supposed to go on this weekend trip together, and then she disappears off the face of the earth because she was starting to ask for her money back. That case right there, I'd vote guilty tomorrow, just given that information, wouldn't you? And then she was made to lay down on the back of the truck. Remember that? Go through some drive throughs even. You probably don't remember the one I'm talking about. Some of you do, I'm sure. I don't remember what her name was, but I bet if you just typed in a few of those things, you'd probably get the answer. All right. Well, I hope you guys found that interesting. I did. I think I might try to follow up on this one a little bit. This one, uh, it's really weird. <laughs> it's just, Seems kind of obvious almost, really. Did they take any scrapings? See, they wouldn't have thought of taking blood scrapings in 1962 because what, what do you do with it? Oh, yeah, we just... It's amazing when people do that, almost like they have foresight.
Okay, now th this one here, this story is crazy, but I, I did a, I think I, this one coming up here, did a pretty good job sort of piecing it together and finding all the different locations. Uh, it's really, uh, you know, it's one of the more disturbing stories we're going to see. Not sure what's going on, why it's flying into the ground over there. All right, yeah, so this all takes place in this one little spot right here. So here we go. That's the day. Let me get the other one. So uh, in Harahan, Flor I think it's uh, Louisiana, man's girlfriend accused... Accused of killing six-year-old, leaving body in a bucket on mother's front lawn. I mean, I don't know if you could find something more disturbing than that. It's it's very upsetting. <laughs> this doesn't happen here, and I feel so bad for the family. You know, a Jefferson parent found it dead in a ten. Just so horrible. In which we was home late last night. So I used these, and I just found these houses on the street. I was able to zoom in on one of them, get the address and I knew the street name so I was able to find all the houses and every single element here. That home is on Sedgefield Drive in Harahan. Investigators say 43 year old Hannah Landon wheeled the buck part of her biological mother's home late last night. That home is on Sedgefield. All right so that's the biological mother's house which is right here. So the, like, the way it works is the father lives right here on 19 Donalan, Don uh, Dunlon. And then the mother lives right here. I couldn't read the address, but uh, this is the house. Uh, I think this is the one. That's a different house. That's where the, that's 19. That's where the father lives. This is where the mother lives right here. Okay, so let's go to the other one really quick. Yeah, this is one of the shittiest stories I've ever heard of. And you go down to right here. And that's the house we were just looking at right there. So 19. So this is where the father lived with and had his daughter and a girlfriend at this house. Sedgefield Drive in Harahan. Investigators say 43 year old Hannah Landon wheeled the bucket from the home she shares with that little girl's father, which is one block away on Donnellan Drive. That's where police spent much of their day today trying to figure out why the girlfriend of the victim's father committed such a gruesome act. Now, investigators also were spending the day searching for Landon. We're told she was found this afternoon at a local hospital. She is now in custody and is expected to be charged with first degree murder. We also heard from the chief of Harahan police who was emotional describing this awful crime. We're a small town. Uh, we're a safe town, and I just want the citizens to know that my heart and my prayers go out to the family of this child. This is a senseless type incident that happened, but I can assure you that uh, the Harriet Police Department and the Sheriff's Office are there for the family. And obviously our hearts break for that family as well. Yeah, so check this out. This is the woman right here. Her name is uh, Han uh, Hannah Landon. I think she, I mean, my wife even said that she looks like she's Filipino, if you, you know, just want to know. Uh, so Filipino girlfriend, and then we've got this, uh, here's the other picture right here. Now check this out, look at this crap right here. She's wheeling the like a little cart and the body is inside this bucket right here. Look at that. She's got those freaking go-go boots on and shit. Are you kidding me? Look. Now on this one, uh, it took me a little bit, but uh, I was able to sort of figure out where that camera shot is. So basically the woman casually strolled around that corner like this, took a left right there, and right there is where that surveillance shot is. 
This is one of those boom ones where you, you find it, right? Like, right there. So you see that this pole right there, the these trees there. It's a little bit, the street view's off on the t dates and everything. But there's the pole. Everything else is exactly the same. The driveway, the grass, how it goes around the corner. It's right there. And then the the thing that you know for certain where it is is when you you okay let me show you again in this picture so in this picture right here are these tulips right here what are these things called right here uh what like that looks like kind of like uh i don't know if they're orchids or tulips what are these things right okay so you go into this picture and then you turn around and look at that these are probably a lot higher and i was thinking okay so those are a lot taller and then i looked right up there Oh, and there's the camera. I mean, it just boom. Okay, so the whole thing works absolutely perfectly. That that is the camera that picked her up, and then she walked down the street, and this is the house that apparently she dumped the child on. Now you got to wonder, like, what in the hell's the motive in a case like this? Is it something where? You know, I, I don't know, man. God, it's a little bit like Letitia Stouk, you know? A little bit. Anybody? Anybody? I mean, it could be something where she saw her hanging out with her husband and, or, you know, like, I'm not going to take care of your kid anymore. Well, you can Who the hell knows what it is? Really wild. The calla lilies? You sure? Lilies? Okay, everybody's typing lilies. On the six year old's death, it's small children from the room. Let's go ahead and take a listen. Bella Fontanelle, six-year-old female. The autopsy was performed yesterday by Dr. Dana Troxclair and Dr. Michael WDSU. Defana, who are forensic pathologists along with the Channel staff six. here at the uh, Jefferson Parish Coroner's Office. Uh, the autopsy was done with dignity and respect. Um, yesterday, a decision was made to not release uh, any details of the uh, cause of death, although we did release the manner of death. Yeah, that's homicide. what I said, Daniel. That was done for two reasons. First, <laughs> Danielle, was I just to said allow that. law enforcement the opportunity to interview the suspect <laughs> before release of any information. And more importantly, uh, the autopsy was performed yesterday afternoon. We didn't want to uh, release any information to the public, obviously, until we were able to explain uh, uh, the circumstances to the family and explain all their, uh, answer all their questions, excuse me. So those notifications have been made. So I'm ready to release some information today because we really want to get ahead of uh, and, and, and dispel a lot of these uh, rumors that are running rampant on social media. Uh, our preliminary cause of death, as determined by the forensic pathologist, is um, manual strangulation along with multiple uh, blood force injuries to the head. Oh, Jesus. Um, it's important. Uh, I, I want to mention there was no... What a barbarian. So manual strangulation and then multiple blunt force trauma to the head. Dismemberment involved. And uh, before I finish, I want to you know, you know, say also, um, you know, EMS, 911 operators, law enforcement, the coroner staff, you know, this is not something we, we're happy to do. You know, it's something... It's hard to see, and it's even more hard to unsee. And our hearts go out to the, the to the families uh, of, of this. Oh, so her name is Buna Lyant Land. How shocking or how terrible is it to see something like this happen to a six-year-old and to, to for these findings to be released? Well, you know, well, look, we're all you know, we're all either a brother, a sister, you know, or a, or a mom or a dad. So, you know, everybody has a way to relate. To, to what happened Thank you, uh, you know, to this poor girl and to her family. You said multiple blood force uh, trauma, do you get how many times? No, no, it's, uh, it's, it's multiple. I know in every case is typically difficult, but tell me how difficult was it for you all dealing with the you know, traumatic experience with this situation? Where, where did they arrest her at? Back home? 
you know, having a drink or something? Or? Well, the, look, the staff here is, is, is very, very professional. And, 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 and we're used to, you know, you know, tragic circumstances. And, you know, there are cases that, that, that stand out. And when it's a child, it, it certainly, you know, rings differently. And it's no different for us as it is for the EMS people who had to go out and confirm death, you know, and the law enforcement people who had to go and investigate this death. It's, uh, you know, quite honestly, it's, it's personal for all of us. Our anticipation would be that yes. Yes. I mean, the answer that. I mean, the thing, the way this worked was, uh, so the father reported her and his girlfriend, Hannah Landon, missing to the Harahan Police Department around 7.30 a.m. So in the morning, he's like, hey, they're, you know, they're missing. Lupino said the father woke up Wednesday morning and noticed his daughter and girlfriend were missing. So this must have been really early in the morning, that image that we see. We're missing from his home on Dunlon Drive. According to investigators, his other child was at the home unharmed. Oh man, he had two, Jesus. Police immediately began investigating at the father's home. They eventually went to the Fontanelle's biological mother's home, which is a street away on Sedgefield Drive. That is where Lapinto said officers found the little girl's body. He told WDSU that her remains were inside a 10-gallon bucket on the front lawn. Investigators began canvassing the neighborhood where they obtained surveillance video. I just showed you where that was from several homes, so they've got more. The videos show a woman matching the description of Landon wheeling a wagon with a large bucket inside uh, to the biological mother's home with a, with a large bucket inside to the biological mother's home. WD, WDSU was given a copy of some of that surveillance footage and can confirm what investigators say. However, due to the nature of the crime, the station has chosen not to share the video out of respect for the child and families involved. Why did, why did you see it, though? I mean, see, that's, what, that's one of those things. Like, why did you look at it? A search was then launched to find Landon. Did, did you have, I mean, I mean, it's funny how they say, out of respect, we're not going to show it. But, you know, you went and got it, right? So, a search was then launched to find Landon. Lapinto said she was later located at an area hospital where she was taken into custody. I wonder if she tried to, like, kill herself really weakly, though. It hurt too much, though, so I stopped. Investigators said the 43-year-old will be charged with first-degree murder. Neither of the Fontenelle's biological parents are believed to be involved, Lapinto said. An autopsy, I wonder if there was a fight or something that happened that night. An autopsy was conducted on Fontenelle Wednesday afternoon, and her death has been classified as a homicide. The cause of death is being withheld at this time. St. Matthew, the Apostle, counseled uh, classes for the rest of the week in response to the crime in a letter sent to parents to school confirmed that Fontenelle was a, kindergar was in, was a kindergartner there. Uh, let's see. It's, but, yeah, so they just read through that. That's the... Let me go back to this. That question's yes. Excuse me. Can you tell us how many times... Um, difficult to tell. There was multiple um, uh, soft tissue injuries to, uh, around the head, um, so we don't have an exact count. Any idea what kind of weapon was used? No, not at this point. No, not that we're. In the, well, that's a question for law enforcement, sir. I know you all mentioned that you had to speak to the parents beforehand before being able to release this to the public. Difficult. I mean, I'll just start off with myself. Difficult for me. More difficult for them. And difficult for the staff members that were with me, uh, and 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 who spoke to them before I got there. It's just not an easy thing to uh, you know to have to relate to somebody. 
you know, but God, well, yeah, what do, what do you say to the dad? You know, oh, yeah, sorry, man. We we just found your daughter inside of a bucket. And we think that your girlfriend did it. I mean, you, he'd feel... Uh, just think how horrible that is that for the father almost the most. He's dating somebody that he trusted that ends up killing his daughter. And he obviously loved, probably loved his wife at some point. The mother or whatever, you know. And, <laughs> you know, just now... He's going to probably feel guilty the rest of his life. But anyways. All right, you guys. Well, we're in one of those little slow, uh, long periods here. So if you guys would like to help support the Gray Hughes Investigates YouTube channel and all the stuff that I do here, uh, the crazy cases that we cover that you don't really see other places because they're not the big ones, uh, I would appreciate your support to, you know, if you can afford it to help support me with the PayPal's and whatnot. And then I, during the month, we've already given away $1,500 this month so far. And at the end of the month, which is coming up in, we've only got three days left. We've got today, tomorrow, the next day, then the day after that is our, our donation night. Okay. And hopefully, uh, you know, I'd like to, you know, at least get to four to 4,500 or something for the month. Uh, we were we were on a better pace than that, and then it just went. <laughs> All right, so if you guys can afford it, want to help support the channel, that'd be awesome. Thank you very much. We did. We answered all their questions, um, and I, I I hope that they're satisfied with how this was handled. You know, by everybody involved, not just my office. Oh, and thank uh, Linda and as well. Jeannie right. on. Venmo, thank you. And we've had some, we've had some tough ones. I mean, it's 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 hard to categorize one over the other. I mean, there's there's a lot of very tragic circumstances. You know, this one sticks out because it's today. You know, this one sticks out also to me. You know, I'm a parent of four kids. Thanks, so, Kathy yeah, Chapin and, and yeah, Annabelle. Snow. The child deaths are always. Terrible, especially ones like this that should not have happened. Nice and solid. Thank you very much. So there you hear it: blunt force injuries to the head. That's terrible. Oof, Jesus, I think yeah, but that's one of the worst ones we've heard of. But it's somehow, I have a feeling it won't be big. Well, thank you, Bama Forever. Jeez. Let's see. Uh, the six-year-old found in Harahan Wednesday was beaten and strangled to death, according to the Jefferson Parish Coroner's Office. Bella Fontenelle, a kindergartner at St. Matthew's, the Apostle School, was found dead inside a bucket on her mother's front yard, according to the Jefferson Parish Sheriff's Office. Uh, the body was intact, and contrary to public speculation, there was no dismemberment. Who the hell comes up with this stuff? Police believe that the father's girlfriend, 43-year-old Hannah Landon, killed her. She was arrested Wednesday afternoon at a local hospital. They don't say why she was at the hospital. London was booked into the Jefferson Parish Correction Center on Thursday facing counts of first degree murder and obstruction of justice. Chewbacca? Oh, I'll be Chewbacca if you want me to. Please help support Jesus. the channel. Very much appreciated. That's insane. It's a 10 gallon bucket. I think it's pretty easy, really. I mean, there's a 5 gallon bucket. It's a girl, too, so she's probably, you know, small. Six-year-old. Yeah, this is a 10-gallon bucket, so it's not a five-gallon. You know, those five-gallons are... I could see that not working, but this is 10. You know, we've got the picture. Like, that's a pretty big, big bucket right there, if you look at it. Compare it to her. 
You know, pretend the kid is about her waist high or something, right? And really skinny, and there's the bucket right there. I mean, it sounds ridiculous to sit there and talk about how a kid, it is in the bucket, so, <laughs> you know, uh, that's not in doubt. I mean, look at her. She's wearing like go-go boots. Almost like she dressed up for the occasion. All right, I'm gonna go get like a drink or something. Not a drink, drink, cause uh, just water. something in the kitchen and they went taken off. She just took off. Yeah, I used to always, I, I used to like whiskey and water a little bit. Come on, you guys, where's the mid-show wave, you guys? Come on, let's go. We gotta get, we gotta get moving here. See what's the uh, I was just thinking of something in that line for the, this case here. How about this? Is there uh, I just don't understand why all these people are killing kids. Who knows? Oh yeah, is there a does she have a Facebook page or something?
Oh, by the way, um, this is for those who watch some of the <coughs> day two of the Jody areas. Look at here's their. <coughs> I remember this site. I just uh, my friends just put it in the, in the chat. <coughs> oh man, I have to get a cup. have been given a bad name lately. Let's show I'm a good wave starter. Ocean wave, ocean wave, ocean wave. All right, you guys, don't leave Amber Maiden hanging up there like you often do with her. Come on. Thanks, Amber Maiden. My waves have been given a bad name lately. Let's show I'm a good wave starter. There you go. What What is it that you sent me here? I don't know what you sent me, Zelda. Thank you. Lisa Valenzuela, all right. <laughs> Bama forever, dude. Thanks again. <coughs> Bama forever. Danielle, thank you so much. Boom. Amber waves of hey amber waves of gray grain I mean is that amazing? Amber maiden, you are a great wave starter. Ocean wave, ocean wave. <laughs> there you go. Look at that, Amber. Look at that, huh? Thanks, John Dunn. I, I suck at starting waves. I said, hey, where's the halftime wave? And zero. Thanks, uh, John Dunn, your mom, and Jessica Schubach. All right, let me just read whatever this is. I don't know what it is yet. These are, this is artwork by Jody, by the way. But forget, who cares? Is she coming in there? It says something like a battery complaint here. Neighbor Amber's wife. Oh, thanks. Beach. Holly G. Smiley face. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Amber waves of gray. There you go, everybody. That's it. <laughs> That's so funny how that works like that. Ocean wave. Amber surfing. Debbie Ocean Smith wave. in Mississippi. Thank you. Or Dobby, I mean. Excuse me. Keep the wave going. So is this something that happened just now, or <clears throat> is this older? Like, where did it come from? Where did you get this? You didn't send me the document. It's just sort of text sitting in a. And thanks, Amber, for starting the wave. Like when you send me a link, just say, hey, look where this came from. 
That way I can just at least have a... No thanks. A blank slate. Okay, it says, um, hold on, it says, battery complaint, while authorities did not discuss any possible motives in the homicide, Jefferson Parish court records show, so this must be a newer article, that Landon had been accused of attacking Bella's mother during a confrontation at Riverside County Country Club. Oh, <laughs> Jesus in Harahan on June 8, 2021. So they had a, a, a confrontation. Bella's mother called Harahan police and told officers that Landon tried to block another relative from hugging one of her daughters during a swim meet, court records said. Landon allegedly slapped away the hand of Bella's mother grabbed her hair and began attacking her until a bystander intervened in an incident report. Wow, what a psycho. Jeez, what a, what a psycho here. Bella's mother was left with scratches on her face and hand, according to police. So this is... Hold on. I just lost wherever I was there. I'm going to see if I can find this on the internet. Just a second. I'm having a hard time. Okay, this could be it right here. Let's see. What? Uh, oh, wait, something just turned off right there. What was that? Uh, battery complaint. So here it is. Well, authorities did not discuss any possible motives. Let me put this in the. Uh, I'm gonna put this in the description just so they get credit for it there. I'm adding it to the sources at the bottom there. Okay, so you got the. Uh, and so let's see. Does it let me do this or not? So let me try to take this and use something else here really quick. <laughs> is it going to work? And okay, there it is. Okay. While authorities did not discuss any possible motives in the homicide, Jefferson Parish court records show that Landon had been accused of attacking Bella's mother during a confrontation at Riverside Country Club in Harahan on June 8, 2021, so like two years ago. Thank you, Robin. Lighting wave coming in light again. <laughs> uh, let's see. Bella's mother called Harahan police and told officers that Landon tried to block another relative from hugging I'm just trying to line things up so I can get through that. Yeah, so Bella is the, Bella's mother called Harahan police and told officers that Land, London, Landon tried to block another relative from hugging one of her daughters during a swim meet. Landon allegedly slapped away the hand of Bella's mother, grabbed her hair and began attacking her. Cause, Cause of course, Bella's mother isn't her mother anymore because this girlfriend is the mother. She's the one that's over that cooking food and stuff at the house. So, yeah, come on. Bella's mother left with scratches on her face and hand, according to police. Landon was described as being extremely uncooperative before accusing Bella's mother of attacking first, according to the report. 
Landon was given a Harahan municipal summons for simple battery. No details were immediately available about the outcome of the case, but Landon filed for a temporary restraining order against Bella's mother because of the incident. Well, of course you did, because you wanted to make it look like she did it. See, this is one of those just horrific... You know, this is more like... Uh, ah, shit, what's his name? Bartleman? Ah, uh, shit. Uh, Francis... Uh, what the hell is the name of that one? Bartleman? No, not Bartleman. What's the name of the case where we just did it a couple weeks ago? The update, they made an arrest where the tire was left in the road. This feels just like that one. I mean, similar like that, where you've got this person who's just really angry and they're going back and forth. Yeah, bright, bright again. I was thinking Beitelman. It was close and almost, you know. Bright again, Beitelman. Yeah, the Microsoft guy, yeah. So it's sort of like... Uh, I mean, it's not exactly the same, but it's the same mentality. Thanks, Melissa South. Bella's mother was left with scratches on her face and hand, according to police. Landon was described as being extremely uncooperative before accusing Bella's mother of attacking her first. Landon was given a Harahan municipal summons for simple battery. No, no details were immediately available about the outcome, but Landon filed for temporary restraining order against Bella's mother because of the incident. That was for payback. Uh, Judge Lee Faulkner of 24th Judicial District Court denied a request on August 5th, 2021 to make the restraining order permanent following a hearing. Yeah, well, because you're the, you live with her daughter and she's got to have the right to be able to see your daughter. And plus they probably saw through your bullshit. Harahan Police Chief Ed Lepper uh, was at an FBI con and thanks for sending that Zozo was at an FBI conference on Orlando Wednesday but flew back to the city after he was notified of the homicide he appeared to choke up as he spoke to the media about the case crazy crazy yeah so early in the morning it sounds like she takes the cart with a 10-gallon bucket with Bella dead inside of it. I mean, how sick is that? Seen on surveillance footage from at least this house here. And then goes right down here and drops the cart off in the yard. Then when the father was, got up in the morning at this house and he couldn't find his daughter and girlfriend... Uh, investigators went to his house first like where are they then they went over to the mother's house and in the yard they found the cart and a 10 gallon bucket and her body inside of that god how sick is that huh? what's going on you guys Jesus it's pure insanity Let's see. All right. Uh, I don't have any more to offer on this. Let me check to see if anything else has come up. Okay. I'm sure more is going to come out on this. There's going to be stories. The husband's going to say. I mean, to be honest with you, you know, if that incident happened, the husband should have been like, you can't do that, you know. And maybe he did. Maybe she felt like, how dare you? You know, I don't know, man. You killed your boyfriend's daughter, too. Okay? You didn't just get back at the mom. And didn't you care about the kid at all since you've been living there? Ridiculous. You know, you sort of wonder if that girl, the daughter, uh, didn't say something to her that was sassy or something based on 
how she is the the this uh, what the hell's her name again? Shit. I could definitely see that. Although six, you're only six. Are you are you that way yet? I don't know. You could see her maybe saying something to. Uh, Uh, what's her Hannah Landon and saying hey you know because uh, the mother I think would probably tell the daughter to be careful and say stuff because of that weird incident for sure and then that girl might say something like well my mom said you know and then it just turned into this horrendous uh, event you know could, I mean imagine a woman like that hearing the six-year-old saying, well, my mom said you're a, you know, blah, 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 blah. And then guess what? You're going to pay back the mom and the kid at the same time. And what the kid said was there was nothing wrong with what the kid said because of the prior experiences about slapping the hand away, things like that. Can you send me the, I was asking for the Facebook pages if you got it so yeah that lady was definitely enraged with jealousy it seems like there's even more than jealousy there I think she just absolutely yeah I mean jealousy is probably at the heart of it really Okay, thanks. Yep, thanks for sending that. Okay, so this is going to have her on there. Then. Okay, so that's the girlfriend right there. And there, yeah, Michael. Trying to see if I can find uh, what. I'm just looking for her name somewhere. Yeah, God, I hope it wasn't one of those kids there. Jeez, that's shitty. I wonder if that's the mother back here, maybe. Yeah, jeez, what a what a nightmare, Jesus. Oh wait, hey, let me try one more thing. Oh, no friends. You'd think she would have commented on here somewhere. What was her first name again? Hannah. <laughs> Hannity, all right. <laughs> uh -huh. Well, that's the same thing that Lori did. Uh, Lori Daybell killed JJ out of spite. So maybe it's sort of 
I mean, who the hell kill, kills a kid out of spite? You know what I mean? Like, uh, the kid didn't do anything wrong. So you're, you're angry at somebody else, so you kill their kid. I mean, look at her walking down the street with those boots on, just acting like it's just... Oh, yeah. This is awesome. Look at this. Boots on. Yeah. <laughs> She paid her back, huh? Ah, God, what an idiot. Isn't that weird? You just sort of look at this whole area, and at some point, some barbarian woman killed a kid right there and then goes down the street. Who would think that that's happening? Well, she looks thinner or whatever in the surveillance footage, but who knows. All right, well, we'll just keep uh, updating on that, see if we can get more information. I mean, there's been an arrest, so it's solved. It's just more about the why. I think the husband will probably have, or the father, anyways, will have a lot of information about that. All right. So there's been some information put out in the uh, Caitlin Markham case. This is the one that we talked about where we showed this guy who had property and he saw a body down a bank a little bit. Now there's a 911 call. This John Carter uh, called Caitlin Mark and we covered this one, God, I don't know, like a year and a half ago or something. Um, oh, by the way, Jerry Springer died. That's kind of sad. <laughs> Even though his shows are ridiculous. Uh, you know, he seemed like a good, nice person anyway. So let's listen to the 911 call really quick. My fiance is missing. I, I can't find her anywhere. Don't come out of left the side. day after friends and family realized that Caitlin Markham wasn't responding to calls or text messages, her fiance called 911. I saw her at like 12 o'clock last night. She stays in a house by herself. Um, so she, I'm just I'm really nervous. Her car is still there. I, like I've been trying to get a hold of her and I decided to go by her house to see if she was okay. And her car was still there. She would be at work right now um, with her car, which is why I'm like really freaking out. John Carter, Markham's boyfriend of six years, recounts to 911 operators what Markham was doing when he last saw her around 1130 Saturday night. Where was she at midnight last night? when you She was at her house. She was going to bed. She wasn't going out to do anything, so she would she would have been in her in her bed. And I mean, I've been with her for six years. I, she's not deceiving, you know. She doesn't. Okay, and you guys didn't have an argument or anything. Not at all. Carter then tells 911 operators about the Sacred Heart Festival that was being held here at the Sacred oh, Heart that. Church in Fairfield yeah. near Markham's apartment. Weird guys there. He voices concerns about the crowd. Mm -hmm. The only thing that's not there is her cell phone, which is positive, but she's not answering it. So, and the Sacred Heart Festival is going on right up the street, and there's a lot of questionable people there. <laughs> Jesus. Okay. So uh, let, let's just, there's this document here, right here. I mean, it's 29 pages at the beginning. It doesn't start the, but it, this goes through the whole thing. This is the search warrant. So do you guys want to go through this? I think we could read his statement first. I think this might be where, he, where it starts. Let's see. 
Facts. Okay, so I think we just start right here then. Page seven. All right. So this is reading, you guys. You know how it gets. Let me get rid of this cough drop. I had that weird tickling thing in my throat. I couldn't get rid of it. Oh, hey, thank, thank you so much, Mama Forever. I appreciate it. Sleep well, sleep well. Yep, I want to get better. Hopefully tomorrow I'll start feeling a little different, you know, like better. What do you mean, did he engage six years? I don't know what that means. Okay. Uh, let's see. John Carter. Or, let me go to her case area so maybe we can make sense of things first. Yeah, so this was done December 2022, so not too long ago. At all, really. Well, no, yeah, so I guess it wasn't that long ago. Seems like it was a lot longer ago, though. So that's only like five months ago. Yeah, a guy named Andy Hooks, founder, right over here. Well, she was found right around in this area. Uh, Affian respectfully submits that the facts below establish probable cause to believe that John Carter, the guy that we just saw, and the 911 caller, I think we were already thinking, now when I think back, it's like, you know, that's the guy, right? John Carter was involved in the 2011 homicide of Caitlin Markham in Fairfield, Butler County, and that John Carter and so and so were involved in it, were involved in the disposal of Caitlin's body in Indiana, which was found wrapped in black or dark colored plastic construction. Is that like a border area or something? Oh, okay. Okay, so she lives over here. Right, so that's a different state, and then she's found right over here. Okay, yep, so that makes sense. Black or dark colored plastic construction landscaping sheet material, and that the plastic material used to wrap her body was obtained from John Carter's then residence at 5101 West... Skiota Drive in Fairfield, Ohio. Fifty-one. I think I might have already had his. Uh, I guess not. Did it say fifty-one oh one? Fifty-one oh one West. Okay, yeah. So it that's it right there. Wow. So he lived right next to. Caitlin, she lived right there. Thank you, Callie Gal 3. Boom! With the reading fund. Yeah, John Carter. There we go. And by the way, have any of you got the new notebooks yet? Because I sent a bunch out two days ago. Sometimes they get there quick. Anybody? Anybody get the new blue notebook yet? Anybody out there? Somebody's got it. It only takes a day sometimes. Oh, look at that. Kathy Friedmaker with some reading juice.
Uh, okay, so yeah, John Carter and some other guy, we didn't, I don't think we know about that, were involved in the disposal of Caitlin's body in Indiana, uh, which was found wrapped in black and dark colored plastic construction and landscaping sheeting material, and that the plastic material used to wrap her body was obtained from John Carter's then residence at 5101 West. Reading juice. I wonder if they made a deal with the disposal person, the guy that helped dispose the body. Uh, where he lived with his mother and stepfather and and or from some other person's then residence at 5271 and court so we could get you could get his name easily so this is the other uh, person it looks like so they think they got the the plastic and whatnot from this location Which isn't far away at all. It's just right there. Or, yeah. God, all these people just live right next to each other. Crazy. So John Carter lived in that house. And then the other guy lived in this one down that cul-de-sac. Caitlin lived there at some point that I had. Uh, where he lived with his, I can't read it, at the facts below established probable cause that more of the plastic material will be found at said residence, notwithstanding the passage of time, given that the house and lot have never been searched in this investigation that John Carter's mother and stepfather have continuously remained the owners occupants of the home to this date and that John Carter has continued to list the residents this is this has been going on for like 13 years 12 years list that residence and his address as recently as 2021 and given the durability of the plastic material that is used as a semi-permanent fixture in landscaping and construction projects and is difficult to remove without detection that it comes in bulk roll uh, bulk rolls and the remnants of bulk rolls can last for many years and that said material is not incriminating on its face and given that said similar material material was used to wrap the body of Caitlin Markin as set forth below <clears throat> On Sunday, August 14, 2011, the City of Fairfield Police Department responded to the townhouse residence of 21-year-old Caitlin H. Markin at 5214, let's make sure I got that one, Dorshire Drive, Fairfield. Yeah, that's the house right there. So look how close these three people live together. Now, to a police report that she was missing, John Carter, then age 23 told, uh, years old, Caitlin's boyfriend of six years and fiancé of one year, so there's the answer to your question up there, was the individual who was contacted, who contacted the police department to file the report. <coughs> Affiant's investigation discloses that Caitlin lived alone in the townhou townhouse, a duplex with first floor, front and rear entrance, and with a parking at both entrances. Caitlin was a student at the Art Institute of Ohio, Cincinnati, and was two weeks from earning her college degree. Yeah, you sort of wonder if she was about to spread her wings and get the hell out of Dodge, you know. Screw that guy. So in this here. Uh, investigation discloses that Caitlin lived alone in the townhouse, a duplex with first floor and rear entrance. Right, she was going to get a college degree. On August 14, 2011, John Carter was interviewed by the Fairfield Police Department. John Carter signed a consent form to search his cell phone as well as his vehicle, a red 2008 Ford Focus, which he acknowledged was the car he drove at the time, including on August 13th to 14th, 2011. 
Affiant notes that he determined from his investigation that John Carter's residence was 0.2 miles from, by, by car from Caitlin's townhouse and just around the corner, a four-minute walk. John Carter advised that on Saturday, August 13, 2011, he woke up at 2.30 p.m. at 5101 West Skiodo Drive in the city of Fairfield, Ohio, the residence where he lived with his mother and stepfather. He spent a few hours at home. He woke up kind of late. John Carter stated that at about 5 p.m., he went to work at Papa John's Pizza, located at 5330 Dixie Highway, Fairfield, Ohio, 45014. John Carter worked for about an hour and was sent home because business was slow. John Carter then called his friend and talked with with him about putting a trailer hitch on John's car for his planned upcoming move to Colorado with Caitlin. After speaking with the friend, John Carter invited him to come over to Caitlin's townhouse at 5214 Dorshire Drive, Fairfield, Ohio, uh, to socialize and discuss their upcoming trip. <laughs> How boring. Hey, dude, dude, hey, 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 check it out, man. Do you want to come over later and we can sit around and talk about our upcoming trip? Yeah, I, I don't think that ever happened. John Carter stated he drove to Caitlin's townhouse at around 7 to 7.30 p.m. after Caitlin got off work. So, so John Carter stated he drove to Caitlin's townhouse at 7 to 7.30 after Caitlin got off work from David's bridal. The friend came over to Caitlin's residence John Carter said that he and the friend smoked some pot and the friend left Caitlin's residence at around 10.30 to 11 o'clock at night, leaving John Carter and Caitlin alone in her townhouse. Carter stated that he stayed at Caitlin's townhouse for approximately another 30 minutes. John Carter further stated he was leaving Caitlin's townhouse at around 11, 11.30 p.m., as he was leaving Caitlin uh, townhouse at 11 to 11.30, Caitlin was preparing for bed. He and Caitlin briefly discussed burning her old financial documents that were in a bag next to the door. I wonder why he brought that up. Carter stated that was the last time he saw Caitlin. John Carter stated, that when he left Caitlin's townhouse at around 11 to 11.30, he drove to a party at a mutual friend's house located at 226 uh, Race Street in Hamilton. So the party was right there. Party after 11.30. Yep. John Carter stated he left the party at 226 Race Street between 1.30 and 2.30 and returned to his home at 5101 West Gyoto Drive. Hmm, I wonder if there people verify that he was there. And remained there through the night and into the next morning. John Carter stated he woke up between 4.30 p.m. the next day, Sunday, August 14, 2011. He watched television and drove to work at Papa John's at around 5 p.m. John Carter stated that around 6.30 p.m., he asked his manager if he could leave so he could check on Caitlin as he had been able, unable to reach her by phone. John Carter stated he drove to Caitlin's townhouse where he saw her car in the back parking lot. John Carter went to the back door. John Carter stated he does not remember if the door was locked or unlocked. He then put his key into the door and went in. John Carter stated he immediately knew something was wrong because Caitlin's dog, Murphy, ironically, 
Oh, yeah, that's right. Remember, we talked about this after the Idaho 4 case, even though this seems like this was way before that. But, you know, the dog Murphy was not in the bathroom like he normally would have been if Caitlin had left the townhouse. John Carter stated that he ran upstairs to Caitlin's bedroom and saw Caitlin's purse with her wallet still in the purse. John Carter stated he started calling family and friends inquiring as to whether they had seen Caitlin. Seen Kate. Well, you know what? I think we covered this case a year or two ago, and then we had an update in the case a few months back. That's right, because there was a, uh, an arrest made of the boyfriend. This is just giving us all the details of it. So, yeah, we covered this a long time ago, and then more recently in an update... And then this is giving us all the details of it. Now, now it's coming back. So John Carter stated he woke up at 4.30 the next Sunday. John Carter stated that around 6.30, he, he asked his manager if he could leave so he could check on Caitlin. John Carter stated that he drove to Caitlin's townhouse. Uh, that's right. So he opened the door. Murphy was not in the bathroom. John Carter stated that he ran upstairs to Caitlin's bedroom and saw Caitlin's purse with her wallet still in the purse. John Carter stated he started calling family and friends inquiring as to whether they had seen Caitlin. John Carter stated that when family members arrived at Caitlin's residence, he drove back to Papa John's to return money he had collected from deliveries while he was at work and then left work. John Carter advised that after leaving Papa John's, he called 911 and returned to Caitlin's residence. When John Carter returned to Caitlin's residence, he went through her purse and retrieved her car keys to see if he could locate her cell phone in her vehicle. John Carter stated he was unable to find Caitlin's cell phone. Affian states that Caitlin's cell phone was never located, has never been located. Then Carter met with the responding city of Fairfield police officers and gave the statement described above. During the interview, John Carter, on August 14th and 15th, 2011, police observed and photographed several red vertical scratches, scratch marks on the left side of Carter's neck. <coughs> John Carter advised the scratches were from the electric razor that he used, although in a later interview, John Carter indicated he was not sure how the scratches got there. Yeah, I don't think anybody out there would have a bunch of big scratches on their neck and go, God, I don't know how that I got that. I guess if you were running through blackberry bushes and just kind of didn't notice. On August 23rd, uh, 2011, the Fairfield Police Department interviewed the friend, explained that he became friends with Caitlin when they worked together at Panera Bread. So this is somebody else. Uh, she stated that on the evening of August 13, 2011, that uh, he went to Caitlin's residence where he, John Carter, and Caitlin, so this is the friend of Carter, smoked marijuana and discussed Caitlin and John's plan to move to Colorado within the next few months. He stated that Caitlin appeared to be working on schoolwork on her laptop and that she never moved from the spot on the sofa during the whole time he was at the residence, he stated that Caitlin seemed distant and not her typically bubbly self. Uh, he stated that he left Caitlin's townhouse at around 10:45 to attend a party in Liberty Township. Oh, you know what you wonder about? Well, did, did he go to that party and then Carter shows up later and says, "Dude, you got to help me out. Something happened after you left." And that's then he left with that. I'm just guessing at this point that John Carter and Caitlin were the only ones in the townhouse when he left. So he said, let's see, uh, what did he say? So he stated that John Carter and Caitlin were the only ones in the townhouse when he left. Note that John Carter admitted the same to police. Uh, he never saw Caitlin again. He stated that he did not recall seeing scratch marks on John Carter's neck's neck on the evening of August 13th. Okay, so maybe you didn't see him later. So that means he got him those scratches after you left. 
He stated that he did not recall seeing scratch marks on John Carter's neck on the evening. As discussed more below, the friend took a polygraph examination at the Clay County Sheriff's Office in Florida on January 19, 2021. That examination indicated uh, he gave truthful responses when he denied knowledge of or involvement in the disappearance and death of Caitlin Markham. The reading energy is going... In a subsequent interview conducted on February 16, 2015, John Carter added new information to his account that had not been provided to police in 2011. John Carter stated that after the friend left Caitlin's townhouse on August 13th, Carter finished watching a movie. Carter stated that he got bored and told Caitlin he was bored. Carter told Caitlin he wanted to go out and do something. Caitlin stated she had to stay home. Carter stated that Caitlin became a little upset. Carter stated that Caitlin had her financial documents. Why do they, what's the deal with these? In a large bag by the back door and told John she needed to burn them. Carter stated that he grabbed the bag full of documents out of her hands and said, I'll take care of it for you. What a hero. Carter started, uh, stated Caitlin got a little huffy. Carter then told Caitlin, I love you. Sorry, in a sarcastic manner. Carter stated that Caitlin laughed at, it, at this. He gave her a kiss and he left her townhouse. Carter stated that was the last time he saw Caitlin. John Carter stated that when he arrived at 226 Ray Street address, several of his friends were at that residence. John Carter stated that some were drinking alcohol, but not, but he did not. John also stated that Soon after he left her townhouse, he received a text message from Caitlin with a picture of her in which he was dressed up. John Carter stated that after leaving the race, the race street address, he thought about surprising Caitlin for going back over uh, to her residence. John stated he was tired and decided to instead go home where he went to bed. Thank you, Kimberly Ann. On August 16th, 2011, Fairfield Police Department received the results of their I subpoena. Should I should wave. Thank you. Subpoena request from Kaylin Markham, cell phone records. The records indicate that texts were sent between the cell phones of Kaitlyn Markham and John Carter around 11.04 p.m. on August 13, 2011. A picture from Caitlin's cell phone was sent to John Carter's cell phone. Additional text messages were sent between Caitlin and John Carter's phones until 11.36 p.m. on August 13, 2011. Hmm. <clears throat> That's weird. On August 18, 2011, John Carter agreed to have his cell phone downloaded by Ohio Bureau of Criminal Investigation. Upon examination of the cell phone, Celebrite download from John Carter's phone and cell phone records Obtained from AT&T, Caitlin Markham's cell phone, and Cricket, John Carter's cell phone, Agent Hoyt uh, discovered that numerous text messages between John Carter and Caitlin Markham had been deleted from John Carter's cell phone. Those deleted text messages were from the hours of 7.53 to 11.36. Yeah, so I bet there was a whole bunch of arguing going on here. AT&T cell records indicate that Caitlin's cell phone went dark, meaning it was either turned off, the battery went dead, or, S, or the SIM card was removed on or about, uh, what is it, 12.06 a.m. on August 14th, so just 20-something minutes after the last text message. So he lives so close, right? So they're getting a text, heated text message. He runs over there really angry. On August 27, 2011, John Carter denied to police that he deleted Caitlin's August 13, 2011 messages from his phone. However, Carter subsequently admitted to police that he had in fact deleted those messages from Caitlin accidentally while trying to make space for the numerous text messages he was receiving in reference to Caitlin's disappearance. Right, right, of course. You can get rid of the last messages ever sent. John Carter also stated 
that he sent Caitlin a good morning text at around 4 a.m. in the early morning of August 14th, but there's no record of that message ever being sent. On September 19, 2011, John Carter voluntarily agreed to a polygraph examination by the FBI. The examination was given by FBI agents at the Fairfield Police Department. The polygraph examination showed that Carter gave deceptive responses when he denied knowledge of or involvement in the disappearance and death of Caitlin Markham. On the 27th, John Carter of 2014, John Carter voluntarily agreed to a polygraph examination by the Indiana State Police. The examination was given by Indiana State Police at the Fairfield Police Department. The polygraph examination showed that Carter gave deceptive responses when he denied knowledge of involvement in the disappearance and death of Caitlin Mark. In August 2011, BCI downloaded John Carter's personal computer obtained by his consent. Maybe I'll do like half of this today and half tomorrow. This is, these are, this is really dense. I mean, we've got, I've done three pages and it's, there's 17 of them. I may not even do half. I'll, I'll just do the whole thing, the rest of it. I'm sort of feeling kind of like, Ugh, you know. I mean, let me do like this page and the next page, okay? In August 2011, BCI downloaded John Carter's personal computer obtained by his consent from his residence. Carter confirmed to police this was his computer. The BCI report of the downloaded indicates that in the early morning hours of August 14, 2011, Carter's computer played the television show White Collar Season 2, Episodes 12, 13, and 14, beginning at approximately 1.39 a.m. At approximately 4 a.m., John Carter's computer visited several pornography sites. Wow. So he got, like, excited about what he did. At approximately 3 p.m. on August 14, 2011, John Carter's computer visited several pornography sites and then visited websites containing plot summaries of White Collar Season 2, Episodes 13 and 14. Ah, so he had it playing as an alibi in, on purpose. So then he went and saw the plot summary. So when asked about it, he could say, oh, yeah, they were. <laughs> that, wow, that's crazy. Uh, while executing a search warrant for Caitlin Markham's townhouse at 5214 Dorshire Drive on August 14th, Fairfield Police Department observed something blood or other bodily fluids inside the residence. While the residents appeared to be messy, there were no signs of physical struggle. It was also noted that Caitlin's laptop and purse located in her bedroom. Cash was found in Caitlin's purse. No property appeared to have been removed from the townhouse other than Caitlin's cell phone. Her dog Murphy was in the bedroom with the door closed. That sounds so similar to the Caitlin's cell phone was not located at a residence and has never been located. Caitlin's cell phone is described as red or burgundy colored AT&T Blackberry. On August 22, 2011, Fairfield Police interviewed a, some, an individual who was the manager of Papa John's Pizza where John Carter worked on the afternoon of August 14, 2011. The manager stated, John Carter showed up for work at a scheduled time at 5 p.m., the manager recalled that John Carter had mentioned to her that he had not yet talked to Caitlin that day and that Caitlin had not responded to a good morning text message that he sent to Caitlin. So again, an alibi, like it's just a spontaneous, wondering conversation with somebody. At approximately 6.30 p.m., John Carter approached the manager and asked if, if it was okay for him to check on Caitlin at her townhouse. The manager stated shortly thereafter John Carter called her and stated that Caitlin wasn't at her townhouse but her purse and car were there. On August 31st, 2011, the manager was interviewed or somebody else was interviewed by the City of Fairfield Police Department. They are the manager of GE Credit Union. They advised that Caitlin came to the credit union about three weeks before her disappearance. Maybe that's why these 
financial records were being burned. On July 20th, 2011, with John Carter's mother, Caitlin wanted to apply for a Visa uh, credit card and the mother was going to sign for it. Hmm. The mother informed them that Caitlin would need to open an account before she could apply for the Visa card. The mother recalled during the conversation that uh, she stated, I'll go, I'll co-sign for the visa, but you've got to take my son to Colorado with you. Oh, wow. So she wasn't going to? The mother remembered laughing and commented to Caitlin, I guess you are stuck now. She recalled Caitlin did not laugh or even smile at the comments. She recalled that Caitlin was very serious and somber during the meeting in her office. During the meeting she advised Caitlin uh, or she advised Caitlin she would hold her application until she decided to open an account she stated that Caitlin seemed hesitant to open the account hmm it's weird well, if there was a whole other reason I, man, I'm interested to see this stated that it did not appear the credit card was Caitlin's idea wow so she's like told to get a credit card, but it wasn't even her idea. That's some weird shit. She stated that on August 9th, 2011, Caitlin came to the credit union and advised that she did not want to open an account and wished to cancel her application for the Visa credit card. Also in August 2011, Fairfield Police interviewed PNC bank teller. I'll just do this page. <laughs> another bank teller two days before her disappearance Caitlin Marked, Markham visited the PNC located at 5333 Pleasant Avenue in the city of Fairfield, Ohio where she had a bank account the bank teller's, teller stated that Caitlin was a regular customer of the bank he had seen her numerous occasions in the previous year and she was very friendly and bubbly and normally engaged in conversation with him and other bank tellers. However, that day, Caitlin did not speak to anyone in the bank. She also stated that he even went out of his way to get Caitlin's attention as she was leaving the bank, but she did not respond, which was very unlike her. Wow. On April 7, 2013, at approximately 11 a.m., skeletal remains were located near the 738 Big Cedar uh, Grove, Indiana. Let's see if that is where I have it. Yeah, I guess it's more right there. Hmm. All right, well, got an update there. A wooded rural area. The skeletal remains were found about 35 feet from the road near a creek. The remains were wrapped in several sheets of black or dark colored plastic. The skull was wrapped separately in a discolored plastic shopping bag. The city of Fairfield Police Department and the Franklin County, Indiana Coroner's Office responded to the scene, collected the skeletal remains, and transported them to Hamilton County, Ohio Coroner's Office for an autopsy and subsequent examination. The skeletal remains were identified by the coroner to be that of Caitlin Markham. Caitlin's death was ultimately ruled a homicide However, based on severe decomposition of the body, a cause of death could not be determined. A forensic entomologist concluded that Caitlin had died in the second or third week of August 2011, the time of her disappearance. On January 23, 2020, the Butler County Prosecutor's Office became involved in the homicide investigation at the direction of elected county prosecutor Michael T. Moser. Affiant has been the lead investigator during the three-year investigation. 
On August 18, 2020, Affiant and other investigators from the Butler County Prosecutor's Office drove from Caitlin Markham's former townhouse at 5214 Dorshire Drive in Fairfield on the two direct routes to 7038 Big Cedar Road, the location where Caitlin's body was found. The trip on both routes was approximately 36 minutes. Note that Caitlin Markham's townhouse was 0.2 miles from John Carter's residence and 0.1 miles from, uh, by car from uh, the, the other friend's residence. This is discussed below. Thus, the blow, blow route would be the most direct from either Caitlin's, John Carter's, or uh, the friend's residence. Okay, well, that's going to be it. We'll start on page 15 tomorrow, okay? <laughs> All right, so just remember that. Just remember that. That's pretty intense. It's really clear, though. Yeah, I need some rest. Yeah, got to get up in the morning and start the Letitia Stauk trial again. I think day what is it, sixteen now? Man, that that uh, Lucille Grenz case that we did at the beginning that that one's really interesting to me. God. How can they notice that there was blood stains in the trunk of the boyfriend's car? And that was just, yeah, you know. I don't know how it got there. <laughs> I have no idea. Okay, yeah, well, you know, that makes sense. On your way, sir. Thanks for your help. So thank you to uh, Jeannie and Linda on Venmo. And then Salty C on Cash App. Thank you very much. A cat eye, actually. So thank you. Then uh, uh, Lori, Paulette Leonard, Tracy. Yeah, Tracy Nixon. She got a notebook. And then uh, Dina. Uh, thank you very much in there. Then uh, let's see. So we had uh, Melissa South, Matthew Ludovico, uh, Melissa South. Bamel Forever shows up with a cat eye there. Traveling Teresa. Then Amber Maiden. Your Gypsy. Tracy Nixon. Stomach. Lori Will. John Dunn. Melissa South. John Dunn again with his uh, For Every Like. Man, you guys could have... This channel could have taken off. We just got a barrage of like a thousand likes. I mean... So John Dunn, uh, Danielle, the new mod, uh, John Dunn again, Lisa Murphy, Eugenie, Realaney Jones, Melissa South, uh, Melissa South upgraded membership to Oogla Boogla. Thank you. Lane S has been here for 39 months. Adnaram, Jennifer Epic. Dan Keith, Kathy Chapin, Annabelle Stell, Melissa Sow, Bama Forever, Amber Maiden. She says, my waves have given a bad name lately. Let's show I'm a good wave starter. And then right after that it was Lisa Valenzuela, Bama Forever, Danielle, John Dunn, uh, your mom, Jessica Schubach, Holly G., Dobby Smith in Mississippi, a blank slate, 
and then uh, Robin, Melissa South, Callie Gal 3, Kathy Frydenmaker, and Kimberly Ann. All right, so let's see. So we have like we're gonna we'll do a notebook because now we can take tonight's night and then the two crummy nights that we had, and we'll just do a spin for a notebook. All right. So here we go. Oh, a lot of blanks in here. All right. Wait, that's right. So now I just move it over here because I don't even have the window set up anymore. <laughs> yeah. Hey, thanks, John. I appreciate your you doing that. Help support there. Let me put you in here. You got two more then. All right, there you go. Chewbacca? Oh, I'll be Chewbacca if you want me to. People are too busy listening to you at Grey Hughes Investigates and not watching the chat for the likes. But why don't they have a like auction? Lol, I like the gamble. Good night, everyone. Yeah, good night, John. Hey, thanks again. Yeah, hit the like button, everybody. It's pretty easy, you know? Pretty easy. Well, I don't like you, Gray, so why would I ever hit it? Well, you don't have to, but the rest of you are just kind of casually watching. I mean, does it hurt you to... All right, so let's get the... Here's for the blue notebook. So has anybody got theirs yet? Did anybody... Re I'm going to go check. Here we go. Look at that. Ooh, look at that. Look at that. Ah, ha, ha, Gen H. Do you have this one yet, Gen H? There we go. Couldn't have gone to a better person. That's awesome. All right. Gen H. This video contains subject. She probably went to sleep. I'll find it. I know. I think I have it somewhere. Like I have old emails that come. In. All right. Well, thank you guys for supporting the channel and the uh, mods and welcome, Danielle. You know. I can't wait for you and Zozo to team up and just be, how can we bug the living crap out of you? <laughs> oh, that's going to be funny. Let's see. Oh, there you are. You won, Gen H. Can you believe that? It's crazy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, I hope I'm, I don't know, I'm just like, God, my lungs feel different. I mean, I don't know, like they're a little bit more irritated today or something. I think that might be because it's going away. You know how you start to, like, shed stuff in there, and then you start coughing. and Awesome. Well, very cool. Uh, did you guys, out of all those cases, didn't you think that that one from 1962 was the more interest? I mean, the other ones are cool, but that one just for a puzzle, a really kind of a quick puzzle with interesting information. Yeah. And I just randomly found that one. I was just, let me look. What does Oregon have? Oh, look at that. Oh, whoa. So, anyways, thank you guys very much. We'll see you tomorrow. And, as I always say, everybody, until next time, be safe out there. Oh, don't forget the Leticia Stauk at 7.45 a.m., all right?
All right. <laughs> Be or my time. My time. Be safe out there. And a one, and a two, and a three, and four. Yeah, I've been hey, doing Hey, Granny, didn't things. talk I much tonight. Gee. And during this whole time, well, I didn't want I you not to see talk. one person. That's not very nice, Granny. That is a. Crime well, disorder. nobody said I was nice, Mary. Like rejecta. I'm a certified human. In fact, they say I'm me. You are mean, Gray. On a stretcher. If you try and play me like an old projector. Crime sector is my nectar. Perfectly gonna give another lecture. Crime collector, freak connector. And I'm always gonna be a bubble vector. Cool deflector. Interceptor. And I'm meaner than a specter with a vector. On his pector with all respect. Just remember, I will take a fucking gesture. I have no agenda. I'm a pretender. And I'll serve it to you straight without the blender. And in the end, I'm gonna send ya on a mission to reveal the true offender. Yeah, so I'll just get right back to work. Alright, everybody? Good night, everybody! Yay! Not too bad, Mary Lou. Not too bad. I was particularly thought it was cool how you didn't sound like you uh, were sick today. Did you get better? Yeah, I think it must be better, Gray. <laughs> All right. What are you laughing at? Never mind, never mind. All right, we'll see you tomorrow. Be safe. Bye-bye.